Nicole actually watched our YouTube series. And so she, she asked, um, or she said, I was watching your YouTube series and saw the um, handstand push-up asymmetry one mm -hmm. and wants to know what exercises can I do to get my first handstand push-up. Nicole, thank you for watching that YouTube series. We, we have a lot of fun filming that. Mm -hmm. um, basically, it's, it's performance. It's a type of movement. And we go through, you can use these assessments to figure out why this movement's difficult for you. And, and then you can use that assessment to help yourself train to get better at, mm -hmm. at that. And I'll be honest, we, we get emails for every subscriber mm -hmm. that does it. And it's one of the highlights of my day is yeah. when I see people subscribe to it. And it's funny because it will come on my phone. And it's just a notification through email and, and a person will subscribe and I'll be like, oh, thank you. <laughs> and I'm like, well, they can't hear that. And, and we're not able to email them back in right. that. But we are so thankful for people that are subscribing and watching the video and, and all that. So to the question, it was, what can I do to get my first handstand push up? Mm -hmm. was the question, right? Yeah. So there it's, it's a buildup process that you have to get through there. Uh, it's there's a lot of steps. Let's mm -hmm. see if I can break it down into these components. Sure. Step number one, you need shoulder mobility. If you don't have shoulder mobility, you should not be going upside down into a handstand pushup. Probably should not be doing an overhead press until you have adequate shoulder mobility. How much shoulder mobility do you need? Enough to get comfortably stacked overhead into that position. It tends to be around 170 to 180 degrees. 170, I even get a little, uh, I don't know if I want our athletes doing it at 170 degrees. If we can get 180 degrees, that's going to be ideal because now we know the shoulders stacking on top of each other. That there's joint centration. It's a, it's a healthier position. They're not compensating through the back by this big arch. It's just better for the body. If we have that shoulder mobility, mm -hmm. don't skip steps. If you don't have shoulder mobility, work on shoulder mobility. Mm -hmm. Once you have shoulder mobility, which is the passive ability to get this thing up over your head. So this would be like, Brandy, take my arm, lift it up over my head. So Brandy lifted my arm for me. That's passive range of motion. Active range of motion is now me lifting it by myself. Mm -hmm. If we have passive range, but we don't have full active range, we do not need stretching. We need motor control, stability, endurance work. So once you have mobility, now we get into that phase, looking for stuff overhead, prone Ys, prone Ts, dynamic stability for the rotator cuff, take care of that foundation first, and then start working towards it. Another thing I'll add into this bucket is, and, and we show this in the video, I think we do. Yeah, we do. We do mm. show this one. But we're doing a vertical press up overhead. When we squat, we're so focused on equal weight through the legs. When we're doing a handstand push-up, one coach that I had, phenomenal coach, mm. she told me, a handstand push-up is an arm squat. <laughs> if you're doing an arm squat, make sure you have equal weight through your hands. And I was like, dang, <laughs> I've never thought of that before, but that makes so much sense but we won't have equal weight through our arms if we've only trained our dominant side and not our non-dominant side with dynamic stability. So we love to use a long sitting uh, bottoms up kettlebell overhead press test mm -hmm. to see how many reps you can do it. Brandy hates this test. I'm so, when I'm we were filming it, she it. was like, do I have to be the one modeling this one? I was like, yes, because then people can see what it looks like if there's a asymmetry or deficiency that needs to be worked which, on. Which I have. Yeah. And you did a great job showing it you. and, and you're working on it. Uh, so, so you want to make sure that you have that foundation before you ever even think of going upside down. Now that test is looking at dynamic stability of the shoulder, girdle, and core stability. Now we want to see what is your actual strength of it? Because what you want to do before you get upside down is make sure with dumbbells or a barbell that you can press weight up over your head. If you can't do that, not wise to go upside down and then come crashing down on your head. So there's a safe way to progress towards that. One of the hardest parts of a handstand pushup is kicking up to the wall. Mm. So then you're probably going to have to have dedicated time after you've shown that you've had enough strength with a barbell and with a dumbbell to get it up overhead. I've seen different recommendations of how much weight should that, should that be. I've seen people say, it should be uh, two thirds of your body weight, three fourths of your body weight. I'm a big fan of saying the more weight that you can press over your head with a barbell, then the better luck we're going to have, not luck, the better success we're going to have with the handstand push up. Yeah. It'll transfer more. It'll transfer more. But as you're working on building up that strength, you can start working on kicking up to the wall, doing it safely, having a mat underneath to get into that position. So 
All of those things come before you ever even attempt a handstand push-up. One thing I forgot to mention, you can use pike push-ups mm -hmm. where your feet are on a box and then your, your head's on the ground, your arms are on the floor, and you're using that to build up reps and to get conditioned into being upside down because your breathing changes when you're upside down, your stability is changing when you're mm -hmm. upside down. So there are some things that you have to get conditioned to um, to be able to do this. So all that comes before you ever even go for the rep of the handstand push-up, but it's worth it. It's a lot of fun yeah. like once, once you get it. But then once you kick up to the wall, we might just do an, do an eccentric. Mm -hmm. Lower yourself down to the mat and then kick off of it. I'm a big fan of doing that versus having a bunch of things stacked up to mm -hmm. where you're doing this little like shoulder wrap of a handstand <laughs> push-up where your elbow's bending five degrees and then you're pushing out of it. Like, I don't know. I don't know how much benefit you're getting out of that. So I like to use the eccentric as long as you have mm -hmm. adequate control. Eccentric meaning going slowly down to your head. Yep, slowly lowering down. And then once you get down to your head, you're kicking off the wall. Right. Like you're not pressing back up to it. That would be the concentric mm -hmm. part of it. So yeah, working on the eccentrics, continuing to build up strength with the barbell, getting more comfortable upside down, and then go for a strict handstand pushup, mm -hmm. right? So many times people will go for a kipping handstand pushup first. No, 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 you haven't built up enough strength to be able to earn the right to be able to use that power. Like people will do it, but that's when we start seeing injuries. So build mm -hmm. the strength first, then go to kipping. I was actually thinking about this last night, weird thoughts at night, but... <laughs> Like if you're having trouble squatting a weight, you can use bands hooked up to something above you to help pull the bar up to mm -hmm. get out. You can just take some weight off, but maybe you want to get conditioned to that weight. So I was thinking of this with a handstand push up of what if we looped our feet into the band, hung the band <laughs> over the rig, you held our held my feet, and then I could get more handstand push ups in. And then I realized, no, that's that's not safe. That's not no. worthwhile doing. Do not try that at home. <laughs> but I will say that's the hard part with a handstand push up is there's not a lot of assistance mm -hmm. that you can get from that. Like you can have a friend hold your legs. All right, push. And now I'm going to give you a little bit of a pop Oops, going yeah. up. But in reality, it's getting the pure strict strength using dumbbells and barbells first, getting comfortable being upside down. And then that, that'll transfer mm -hmm. over to it. Brandy, I want, I want to know your thoughts on this because handstand pushups are something that traditionally have been a challenge, not just for you, for, for everyone. It's a hard movement mm -hmm. to do. But you've gotten to the point of progressing from pike push-ups to now kicking up to the wall to now being able to do an eccentric. And I, I think by the fall that you're going to be able to do that first handstand push-up. That'd be so cool. But anything I miss in there, any advice that you have? No, I that? think I think the biggest, to wrap up everything you just said, it's really just follow the right process because I think we get so excited. Like when I walked into my CrossFit journey, I was like, Ooh, I would love to do handstand push-ups or handstand walks or ring muscle ups. Like those just look like such yeah. fun movements, but I can't do them. And I've been doing CrossFit for a year or two now. I I would I did CrossFit, but not really for like a year. And then Dylan was like, "You need to." When people ask you if you do CrossFit, you can say yes. And I just like felt awkward about it, so I didn't. But like in reality, I've been doing CrossFit for a little bit. But like I am, I'm following the journey. I'm following the path. I'm and I'm striving to do it um, the, the right way. That's the best for my body, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I really hope maybe by the time that this episode is launched, I can do one. That would be so cool. But, yeah. um, I think, you know, the, for me, the thing that I didn't realize was that I would get dizzy a lot, like mm. with the vestibular system, like my brain just goes crazy. And so build, building up the upside down work mm -hmm. has, has helped a lot. And I think the other biggest thing, like, obviously, Nicole, you're asking this question because you're excited and you are eager and you want to do it. But I also recommend um, if you're eager and excited, but also a little nervous, like do your best to trust yourself, trust the strength at, like during the process. Because I think for me, sometimes I'm like, I'm afraid I'm going to fall still, or I'm afraid that if I fall, I'll get hurt, or I don't trust that I'm going to when I do kick up that my hands are going to be far enough out from the wall, like those little things. And so as you're building up strength, as you're doing the process that Dylan explained, also trust like your body and like what you're doing with your body in that, because I think that's also very important. Yeah. So, so discipline, right. Right. Because there's so much temptation around it of, Oh, but I could just go and kip or mm -hmm. I could stack up five ab mats and do an inch <laughs> handstand push up. And ask yourself, well, what is your goal 
and, and what's the temptation that you need to be disciplined to? Because I, I will fully say this, that I very much used to ego lift mm. all the time. For my first three years of CrossFit, I was with like my best friends and, and we still all do it. We're just all in different parts of the country now, mm -hmm. but we'd all get together and it would be like, we'd have a, have an hour break during class. So we'd go to the CrossFit gym and we would just throw down. And we look back at the way that we were working out and the way that we were training and we were like, oh gosh, yeah. hopefully we did that so that we can coach people of, the, of exactly what not to do. Right. You know, like for one of us, it worked out who's a CrossFit games athlete. Right. But, but for the rest of us, we're like, okay, yeah, we were doing way too much too soon mm -hmm. for a long time. I could squat snatch more than what I could overhead squat. And that's still the case. And it's something that I'm now working on because I realized I skip steps yeah. and yes, I can squat snatch and I can get heavy weight, but I'm doing it by compensating. I'm using load to get into the position because I haven't created enough integrity to get to the position on its own. Mm. So now after this is my eighth year now of doing it, I've had to go back with a PVC pipe and learn how to actually overhead squat mm. to get in a better position to be able to actually snatch because I just compensated, compensated, and guess what? I hit a plateau. Mm. And no matter what I did at that plateau, no matter how cute, no matter how fancy I got, mm. I couldn't get past that plateau yeah. because I was compensating. I had to go back to square one, redo the fundamentals, and then I'll, to be continued, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll let you guys know where, yeah. where we end up with it. But that's kind of been my experience is I really had to take that step back, relearn everything, ask, okay, why was I attempting to do that weight? Why was mm -hmm. I attempting to go at that speed? It's because I was with my buddies who were thrown down and I didn't want to yeah. lose. So it was like, let's go, let's go, let's go. And it's been such an honor coaching athletes now. And, and Brandy, as an example here, with pull-ups. We didn't yeah. allow Brandy to do a kipping pull-up until she could do five strict pull-ups. Mm -hmm. And then in the Open this past year, one of the workouts ended with pull-ups. And Brandy got there and repped out. How many did you get? I think like 13 or 16 strict pull-ups. 13 to 16 strict pull-ups. The other people in the gym were like, how the heck did you do that? Because they kipped gassed. maybe five or six of them. Yeah. But she did these strict because she put the work in. Now she's kipping. We did the Murph. She did a hundred kipping pull-ups. Yeah. And then she was like, oh, it actually was like pretty easy. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's easy because you've put the work in for the strength. So it's very, very appetizing to dive in and skip the, fun the foundation, the fundamentals. And I'll say from a physical therapy standpoint, most CrossFit athletes I work with, when we follow their journey, what ends up brought on, what brought on their injury was that they skipped these steps. Mm -hmm. So then we're working back at these steps and then the coolest thing happens. We, we work on these things. Like let's use a deadlift, for example, they hurt their back deadlifting. We go back, we find that they have this glaring hamstring asymmetry. We work on isolated hamstring strength. We don't do a deadlift for a while. We bring the deadlift back in and they PR. Mm -hmm. And they're like, how the heck did I PR? Yeah. We haven't worked on my deadlift. Yeah, we worked on your limiting factor. And I wouldn't be surprised now if your squat gets better, if your jumps get better, if everything else gets better because you took care of that limiting factor. Right. So don't skip steps. Yeah, don't yeah. skip steps. And especially for, you know, a cro if, assuming that this is a CrossFit athlete, but specifically for CrossFit athletes, like if you're doing CrossFit, you're probably in it for the long game. Like you, you are doing it because you love it and it's, you know, you enjoy the way that it, feels in your body and all these different things. But if you're in it for the long game, like do it, do it the right way. And not to say other people are bad for the other, like you're not bad because you did it the way that you did it. But like, if you did it the right way, you would be a stronger, better athlete now, but instead you're having to take step or steps back in order to go forward. Right. Exactly. 